All right, so uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is John Parkinson. Uh, I'm a uh, scientist at uh, the Sick Kids Research Institute here in Toronto. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, metatranscriptomics. So just to get a bit of feedback, who here has done any tra metatranscriptomics? I, I'm not seeing any hands raised, okay? Ha who's heard of metatranscriptomics? And who's interested in using metatranscriptomics? Okay, okay, good. All right, so um, yeah, metatranscriptomics, I, I guess it's been, I think, about six years since we published a paper on metatranscriptomics. There still doesn't seem to be that much that gets published on metatranscriptomics. So it still seems to be something that people aren't really uh, adopting at the moment. So I'm hoping by the end of this, uh, kind of this lecture, this tutorial, it will give you maybe a bit of a confidence and idea as to why you might want to think about uh, pushing metatranscriptomics more in your own research. All right, so let's just go over the learning module. So the idea is that I think at the end of this module, we want you to have a good understanding of the capabilities of metatranscriptomics, what it can do. Uh, I want to outline uh, some of the issues and challenges associated with metatranscriptomics concerning things like sample collection, experimental design. Um, and then we're going to go through the various steps in terms of processing the data. And it's relatively straightforward. It's very similar to, to processing metagenomics data uh, with a few kind of caveats. But um, we want to walk you through the pipeline, and that's what the tutorial is, is really all about. And so by the end of it, um, you'll be able to, and the tutorial will take you through the various steps of processing um, a, a metatranscriptomic data set. All right, so why metatranscriptomics? So 16S ribosome RNA surveys, they're great for telling us who is actually there, but they don't really give us much in the way of mechanistic understanding. So uh, this is a study from a colleague uh, in Colorado that was published, I think, 2008. And this is a breakdown of taxa from a normal gut from an IBD gut. And you can see that there's a difference in terms of the taxa that are there at different points in the gut. But you don't really have an idea of what it means. So you don't know if that's actually a causal relationship or whether there's actually any functional consequence associated with that. So subsequently, people have been turning to metagenomics. So metagenomics is where you do all the DNA in a sample. You, just don't, you don't use just a, a, a marker gene. So we um, covered a couple of lectures on that. And here, you're getting an idea of what can the microbiome actually do. Okay, So I like this study. This is from 2012. Uh, this is from the Human Microbiome Consortium. There's about 120 different individuals. They sampled from six different sites. And then they perform a taxonomic breakdown, which is the top one, and then a functional breakdown in terms of metabolic pathways based on metagenomic data. And what I want you to see is across each of these body sites, each individual seems to vary very dramatically in terms of the different microbes that are actually there. But when you look at the actual functions, the sites are very specific. So in a way, it almost doesn't matter what bacteria you have there if they're all giving you the same types of functions. Uh, and they're moving into metatranscriptomics. So this is... Uh, Kind of the next step up from metagenomics, if you like. Metagenomics is giving you the functional potential, but metatranscriptomics is actually telling you who is active, who is doing what within your particular microbiome. All right, so um, just to reiterate that metatranscriptomics really focuses on community activity. Uh, and the basic idea is we've all heard, <coughs> who hasn't heard of RNA seq? All right, good. So metatranscriptomics is basically RNA-seq, but you're applying it to microbiome rather than in it, uh, an individual. And the idea is you're getting these kinds of readouts where you can map these kind of gene expression profiles onto these kind of functional modules. So this is a set of genes that are involved in cell wall biogenesis. And then the shapes of these nodes, the size of these nodes, indicates the relative expression. So the larger nodes indicate that there's a lot of that gene being particularly expressed. And by placing it in these kind of 
networks, if you like, these functional module networks, you get an idea of what are the particular functions that have been up or down regulated in a particular sample. In move uh, next step, this is the same kind of uh, graph view, but here we're now representing each of these genes by a pie chart. And these pie charts are now giving you a breakdown of what are the taxa that are responsible for expressing each of these different genes. So it can really, the, the, these kinds of tools, these kinds of visualizations can really give you an idea of drilling down into your data, understanding what are the pathway differences between samples and potentially what are the taxa that are contributing to those pathway differences. So this is really kind of the output that metatranscriptomics is, is able to give you. So um, just to illustrate the capabilities of metatranscriptomics, I want to uh, just have a short vignette on a study that we published last year, uh, which was focused on um, a model of obesity. So this is perilipin 2. It's a gene. A um, mammalian gene that's involved in fat absorption. Um, so uh, it's been found that when you delete PIN2 in mice um, and you feed those mice a high fat diet, the mice seem to survive that high fat diet. So they don't have any of the negative consequences associated with the high fat diet. And the idea is that perilipin2, it's this protein that interacts with lipid droplets and enables a lot of fat uptake within the intestine. And so our question was well, if you're going to have this PIN2 knockout, you're not absorbing as much fat into the host. So what is the consequence on the microbiome? So this was our experimental setup. We've got two genotypes of mice. We've got wild type. We've got a PIN2 knockout. We're feeding mice a high-fat diet, a low-fat diet. And we're using four mice in each sample. So this gives us uh, a number of replicates that can help boost the significance of some of our findings. Uh, and I'll touch briefly on kind of sample numbers um, in a little bit. So for each of these mice, we take uh, sequel contents. We then generate around about 20 to 30 million sequence reads uh, using RNA-seq um, from each of these mice. And then we push them through our pipeline. So the first thing we did is to look at what is the taxonomic abundance associated with uh, these uh, four different types of mice. And what we find is that while there are differences between the high-fat diet and the low-fat diet in terms of uh, different taxa that are differentially expressed, when you look at the diets themselves and the two genotypes on the same diet, uh, we found no significant differences in the taxonomic breakdown. So the genotype doesn't seem to be having any impact on the types of bacteria that are there. This is kind of interesting. Because when we look at the actual transcripts and the transcript expression, we do actually find that there are large differences in the transcripts that are actually being expressed. Okay, so you've got the same community uh, across these two genotypes, but they actually seem to be expressing different functions under, under a high-fat diet. Um, so this slide, a little bit complex, but um, basically we were able to identify 200,000 bacterial transcripts across our samples. And this gives us a breakdown across the four types of samples. And we see that there's a core set of 78% or so of, the, of all the transcripts seem to be expressed across all four samples. The more interesting graph is this one on the right-hand side, where we're just focusing on the highly expressed transcripts, so those that seem to be in high abundance. And we see that each of these sample types has a significant population of transcripts that appear to be highly expressed that aren't highly expressed in the other sample types. Okay, So this is almost the reverse of what we saw in that previous paper from uh, the Metagenomics Consortium, where you had different communities expressing the same function or encoding the same metabolic functions. Here, we've got the same communities, but they're actually expressing different functions. And so this is why we think it's important to uh, pursue metatranscriptomics, because this is starting to give you some insights that just looking at taxonomic abundances just isn't going to provide. Any questions on this so far? Oh, okay. Um, so when we start looking at what these transcripts are involved in, we can map them into these metabolic pathways. We can do gene set enrichment analyses. And we can find that, what is it, out of 180 different metabolic pathways, as defined by the KEG uh, Metabolic Pathway Database, around about 42 of them seem to be uh, enriched in these differentially expressed transcripts. Um, 
in the high fat diet for the two genotypes. So the two genotypes under a high fat diet are, are, seem to be changing the expression dramatically of a lot of their metabolic pathways. Uh, when we focus in on one of these pathways, so here we have glycolysis. Um, the light red nodes indicate enzymes that are upregulated uh, in the uh, PIN2 mice under the high fat diet. These darker nodes indicate enzymes that are downregulated by the PLIN2 mutant under a high fat diet. And I hope you can see that there's this large chunk of this pathway here, and it's a kind of a linear section which takes you from fructose 6-phosphate all the way down to pyruvate. This is all downregulated in uh, the bacteria uh, associated with the microbiome from the PLIN2 knockout. Okay? This is kind of a key part of glycolysis because this involves the production of a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. So it seems to be under a high fat diet, the PLIN2 knockout, the microbiome is actually downregulating its ability uh, or its functions to produce a lot of energy. And so this gives rise to uh, a model such as this where in the wild type mice where we have PLIN2, the PLIN2 is involved in lipid droplet formation. It means that the high fat, the triglycerides, are being absorbed by the host, which means you don't have so much triglycerides available for the microbiome, you just have sufficient to produce energy. On the other hand, under a PIN2 knockout, you don't have this PIN2 protein, you don't get the same lipid droplets being formed, you have an abundance of these triglycerides. This abundance of triglycerides means that you, in addition to having sufficient triglycerides in order to uh, produce energy, you now start upregulating some of these other pathways that are actually resulting in biomass generation. So formation of amino acids and all the components that a bacteria need to grow. Okay, so I just wanted to show this to illustrate how you can use metatranscriptomics to really start drilling down into potentially some of the mechanisms uh, and generating hypotheses which you can now go back and actually test whether something like this is really happening or not. Okay, any, any questions? Oh, all right, so how do we actually go about doing metatranscriptomics? So it's, as I mentioned, it's basically RNA-seq, but we apply it to the microbiome rather than uh, individual uh, tissue. So here we have a mouse, we extract uh, some of its gut contents, we extract the RNA from those gut contents, and this RNA is basically a set of transcripts from all these different species. These transcripts are then fragmented, you're sequenced, and now you have the task of aligning these, all of these reads to known transcripts, and then that gives you a relative expression, a kind of a digital readout, if you like, of each of the different bacterial transcripts that are in your particular sample. So, as I mentioned, RNA-seq is normally applied to a single organism where you have a genome sequence, and you have a reference uh, genome that you can map to. So one of the challenges that we're facing when we're doing uh, metatranscriptomics of, uh, of microbiomes is that we don't have a very good set of reference genomes. And so doing this mapping step, doing this annotation, trying to understand what each of these reads belongs to, that's really the major challenge that, that we face. Uh, so just to reiterate that, in a typical RNA-seq experiment, normally you apply it to a eukaryote. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. No. So with respect to the energy producing pathways, how is it known that those are energy producing pathways? Has that been, is there some kind of reference? Uh, so I, I understand there's a keg database, but then has there actually been evidence of these being energy producing pathways in bacteria? So, Very so, basic question. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, so no, no, great question. So uh, that part of glycolysis is the bit that's generating a lot of ATP. So that's biochemistry being worked out over decades where they can actually calculate how much glucose will lead to how much ATP and that's one of the major uh, pathways by which you generate ATP in uh, energy metabolism. And then with respect to the RNA-seq data, how do you establish the thresholds that are uh, deemed to be significant in terms of upregulation and downregulation? Is, is it a different uh, threshold that one looks at with the microbiome as opposed to say human data? So, so yes, that's a, that's a very relevant point. So, we go from identifying which of these pathways are significantly differentially expressed, and we use a gene set enrichment analysis there. So we take all of the transcripts, 
and we compare them between the two samples. So in this case, it would be the PLIN2 knockout versus wild type. And we use a program called DEseq, which is a, a program that predicts differential uh, expression between transcripts across two different data sets. It's been widely applied to RNA-seq data, um, and it actually works pretty well for microbiome data sets as well. So that will give you a list of those transcripts which are significantly differentially expressed. We use those in these gene cell enrichment analyses to identify which pathways seem to be enriched in these, uh, in these uh, significant um, transcripts, uh, differentially expressed transcripts. We then select pathways from this that we know uh, there's, there's glycolysis, so that was one of the ones that was significant. And all we're doing here, we're not, we're not actually now going back and looking at the significant transcripts, we're just looking at fold changes between the two samples. So this is just to look at what is actually happening within this pathway. Is there a consistent pattern up or down? So there's no, there are statistical methods that can pick out these kinds of pathways where we haven't applied them here. Here we're just looking at simple fold change. Taxonomic data, like if there was a lot of diversity there, but in this type of representation, you're taking all glycolytic pathways from all bacteria there, even if they're very divergent from each other, grouping them into a single. So, so can, but you can also probably break it down. We did, and it does get quite complex, and we've created those kind of plots, and the ways that you visualize these data because you're starting to get into kind of multi dimensional data sets that you want to understand what is the contribution from each taxon to each of these enzymes starts getting a bit tricky, especially with these levels of coverage where sometimes we can miss enzymes and you get incomplete enzymes and so forth. So at the moment, we're currently kind of aggregating together. And yes, again, another challenge that, that we're facing is the consistency of pathway expression across different taxonomic groups. Absolutely. Yes. The previous slide you were mentioning about RPK MDs for the IDF. Which one? Digits, you know, this one here at the bottom? Yes. RPKM, yes. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, the reason why you chose RPKM instead of uh, log code change uh, uh, is it because you have only one sample uh, or uh, you don't have any replicates for that? Or? So, so the RPKM here is just referring to one sample. So there's no fold change. It's not relative to anything. The RPKM is just our normalized measure of expression. And then we're using the RPKM values in this graph to actually come up with the fold uh, difference. So the, the log fold difference is between the uh, RPKM values. OK. And what about the low, uh, low expressed genes? Like, uh, uh, what is the threshold for selecting them? Uh, so I think we chuck out anything which has an RPKM less than 5 when we do these analyses. So there, again, that's to do with DEC, and, and you can set the thresholds as to what you kick out or not. So generally, I think about 5 to 10 is the level that people generally look at when they're uh, examining the RPKM cutoff for expression. OK, good, great. OK, so. Um, so just to remind ourselves, uh, so in an RNA-seq experiment, typically applied more in, it's typically been applied more in eukaryotes rather than bacteria. And the idea of RNA-seq is to get an idea of differential transcripts or alternative transcripts that might be expressed. Helps in genome annotation, so you can identify where all the genes actually are. Um, and to a lesser extent, they're actually using it to look at uh, differential expression across uh, different tissues. That's coming more into the fore. And we're also seeing more and more of these applications in bacteria as well. However, for microbiome samples, we got a number of problems. So first of all, because most of the RNA-seq is developed either on individual bacteria in isolation or on eukaryotes, eukaryotes have this very nice poly A tail that you can select for. Okay. So one of the issues we find with RNA-seq when we apply it to bacteria is that these ribosomal RNA molecules are in really high abundance. They can represent about 95% of your data set. Sequencing a 16S gene, say, several million times isn't really that informative, and so you want to have some way of getting rid of all those ribosomal RNA genes. The second challenge we face is that these environmental microbiome samples that we're sequencing from, 
we don't have a complete set of reference genomes. And so mapping and identifying what each of these reads actually is, what it's coming from, is, as I mentioned previously, quite a significant challenge. Okay, so starting at, I guess, the beginning of the metatranscriptome pipeline, sample collection, RNA extraction. Uh, so the first thing we have to bear in mind is that RNA, unlike DNA, tends to be a little unstable. Uh, so it can deteriorate pretty rapidly. And so depending on the method that you use for storing the RNA, that can have quite an impact on the types of transcripts and the kind of taxa that you can recover. So our suggestion is to process your sample immediately to extract the RNA, and then you can stick it in the freezer. The next best, potentially, is to snap freeze your sample in liquid nitrogen, store it at minus 80, until you have a chance to actually do the RNA extraction. But if you can, uh, if you can extract the RNA as quickly as possible, that's what we find is best. Uh, there was some talk earlier about use of RNA later. This seems to be a topic that seems to come and go, and there never seems to be much of a definitive answer. But talking with um, colleagues in Colorado, um, they're kind of convinced that what happens with the RNA later is that it can uh, selectively lyse some cells um, and it can also interfere with RNA extraction kits. And so we tend not to use RNA later in any of our samples, despite the fact that it does seem to be very good at preserving RNA. We think that it's just the biases that it um, produces that we just kind of avoid its use. Um, Another question that comes up is number of biological replicates. Um, so um, Fiona mentioned over the weekend uh, that um, there are papers that she's now seeing um, that are being submitted to journals that are getting rejected if they don't have at least three replicates. So it's a relatively new field. The bar is pretty low. I would say at least two. Probably now we're moving to at least three. In our mouse model, we did four. Uh, we recently did a large chicken study. Uh, we were looking at the impacts of antibiotics and diet on chickens, and there we've used five chickens per um, particular sample. So this seems to be becoming uh, more of an issue, but at the same time, I would also suggest that it really depends on the question that you want to ask as well, because you could just do one sample just as a discovery phase to see what is actually being expressed in your sample, and then maybe identify some of the genes, some of the marker genes within that sample, and go back and actually test those in a much more cost-effective way. That's the biggest drawback to medical transcriptomics. It's a bit expensive, so it's around about three or $400 a sample, relative to 16S samples, which are, I think Morgan's facility is around about $20, $25 a sample. So, it's a significant order of magnitude more expensive. And so that's really why people are kind of edging on the, edging on the um, number of biological samples they can get away with. So going back to this idea of these kits and these sampling approaches, I wanted to just uh, mention uh, this study that was published uh, last year, which was looking at different standardization, different kits, and the influence of different kits you get. And in this case, this was just DNA. Uh, how many of you uh, came across this this paper, this this study? Okay, so this was um, a contribution from I think about ten or twenty different labs from around the world, where they say, okay, we need some kind of standardization as to how we're doing microbiome. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to compare from one study to another. Let's look at what all these different approaches, how they influence uh, the kinds of results that we're getting at. So in their particular um, pipeline, you go from specimen all the way down to extraction, storage, live preparation, sequencing. They looked at each of these steps and saw and tried to identify which of these steps can actually influence your actual results. And they find that pretty much every single step here is going to dramatically impact what you actually find. So there's a real need for better standardization uh, and understanding what are going to be the best approaches, the best standard approaches for um, analyzing these data sets. So in this, these two graphs on the right here are looking at DNA extraction kits, and there's 21 different kits. 
Uh, this top graph is the percent of DNA which is relatively short. So you see that that kit, that kit, and that kit produces relatively short uh, fragments of DNA, so they're kind of discarded. And then this bottom one um, gives you how much DNA are you able to extract. And then these kits, 3, 4, 10, 12, whatever, they're able to filter out these kits because they're just not very good at extracting very much DNA relative to some of these other kits. This is a breakdown of taxa that these different kits were able to um, recapitulate as well. And here we have gram positives, here we have gram negatives. These are replicates, so sample one, sample two. The replicates are pretty consistent. So each kit, if you give it, if you give it replicates, seems to give consistent results. But you can see that this kit here, these two kits here are very good at extracting DNA for gram positives. This kit here, very good for gram negatives, not so much for gram positives. So depending on even the DNA extraction protocol we're using, that can really bias um, what you're actually able to recover. So I just wanted to mention the need for this kind of standardization and thinking about what is the actual kits that you're using, what are the approaches you're using, and try and ensure that you're doing consistent approaches to what the rest of the field is looking at. Okay, so back to RNA-seq. <clears throat> so I mentioned that bacterial messenger RNAs, we don't have a poly-A tail, so we can't use that to pull down and select for messenger RNAs, which means that we have all these very abundant ribosome RNAs. So fortunately, there are kits available to do this. Uh, so this is uh, the one we use, Ribo Zero Gold Kit. Uh, this is their data. So when you don't deplete, you get 72% ribosomal RNA, only 4% of uh, messenger RNA. When you deplete with ribo zero, you can see you get much more messenger RNA uh, relative to ribosomal RNA. So it's a pretty good kit. However, it does have biases, so it's not very good at getting rid of ribosomal RNA from actin and bacteria. Okay, so again, you're getting these biases that are coming in depending on how you're handling and treating uh, your samples. However, this, this, this is really um, kind of a gold standard for what we do for um, minimizing contamination from ribosomal RNAs. So I think when we first started six years ago, there was a ribo minus kit, not a ribo zero kit. The ribo minus kit would only eliminate about 30 to 40 percent of the ribosomal RNAs. Now these kits are eliminating around about 95, 99 percent. So they're doing really a very good job of removing um, the ribosomal RNA. Um, again, though, another cost uh, kind of consideration is how many reads do you actually need to generate in order to um, say you've got a good understanding of the functional capacity or the functional um, expression within our particular data set. So this is a rarefaction plot, uh, four different types of microbiomes, a deep sea kimchi, mouse, uh, cow rumen, and we're just looking at the number of uh, enzymes, enzyme classification numbers, so this is kind of the enzyme capabilities of each of these samples. And we find that around about 5 million reads or so is sufficient to kind of saturate what you're going to discover in terms of the enzymes that are being expressed within your sample. So we're using that as a kind of a guide for a minimum number of reads that you need to generate, messenger RNA reads that you need to generate in order to get an understanding of the functional capacity, uh, functional capabilities of your particular sample. So this means that Rather than using technologies such as 454 4, 4 sequencing or MySeq, which are very good platforms for generating quite long reads or pack bio now, what we need is, is, is quantity. We need millions of reads that we can map and get a good kind of dynamic range of each of the genes and how much each of those genes is actually being expressed. Um, so with kits, so with the kits like the Ribo Zero kits, we're getting 25, we're now up to maybe 50% of our reads we can actually map to a messenger RNA. So around about 20 million or so reads per sample is what we're currently suggesting. Okay, so you've gone through your sample preparation, uh, you've extracted the RNA, uh, you've made your kits, you've done the sequencing. So this is where the hard work now comes in. 
it's actually doing the analysis and it's processing all those sequence reads to actually make something informative out of it. So this is kind of my lab's bread and butter. Uh, we develop these kinds of pipelines that will take these millions of reads and pass them through the pipeline and try and make some sense out of them. And a lot of these pipelines, and there's, uh, there's an increasing number that are starting to get published. Again, very similar to metagenomics analysis pipelines, at least at the beginning of the of the process. So at the beginning of the process you have these kinds of initial processing steps. You want to remove low quality reads, you need to remove the adapter sequences, there's host contamination, uh, and then in the case of um, metatranscriptomics there's a ribosomal RNA that you need to identify which may have not have been removed by the kits. Okay, so those are fairly standard. Those are little tools that you can plug in and you stitch them together within your Python or Perl scripts or whatever. And you come out with what you hope is a set of reads of putative messenger RNA origin. And now this is where things get a bit fun because you then have to try and map those putative messenger RNA reads back to some kind of transcript which can give you some kind of information about what it actually came from. So the first thing we do is an assembly method. We find that if we're using a machine like Illumina HiSeq, you're generating reads at about 100, 125 base pairs in length. We find that those are quite short, and it can be tricky to actually annotate those. So if you can, the magic numbers around about 170, 200 base pairs gives you a much greater ability to actually annotate them. So we do an assembly step to see if are there reads that are coming from the same transcript that we can piece together and we can use those to create a longer kind of uh, contig, if you like, and then you can use those to get a better idea of what, uh, tra what the original transcript it derived from. So there's this assembly step and then there's a whole set of annotation searches where we, once we've done the assembly, we pass each of those contigs, each of the unassembled reads against uh, a series of sequence similarity search pipelines to try and map all of that information to known, uh, to known genes. So hopefully by the end of this step, what you have is a set of known transcripts, bacterial transcripts. You'll have an expression amount associated with that transcript, so you'll know how many reads are mapping to each of those transcripts. You now want to put those in some kind of functional context. And so there's a whole bunch of tools that you can now plug in. You can push your transcripts through uh, something like an enzyme annotation pipeline to identify which of these transcripts are enzymes and then start piecing together um, uh, the pathways from that. You can, you can add all sorts of tools depending on what you're particularly interested in. So we've recently started looking at antimicrobial resistance genes. There's databases out there like the CARD database that you can, again, take your set of transcripts, pass it against the CARD database and identify all those transcripts associated with different antimicrobial resistance mechanisms. Okay, So these are kind of, if you think of them as kind of tools that you could slot in yourself depending on what is the specific question, what are the specific sets of genes that you're particularly interested in. And then once you pass it through these tools, you, there's different kind of visualizations or statistical methods that you can then use to integrate those data sets to actually turn it into some kind of more rational, informative set of data to tell us what is happening about our systems of interest across these different data sets. So, for example, in the case of uh, the mouse samples, we might look at enzymes and then those enzymes back into those pathways and then we use some kind of visualization tool to actually look at what is actually happening at the end there. So in the tutorial, we'll actually take you through each of these different steps to give you a bit of an understanding of what each of these will actually entail. Uh, the data set that you're actually going to be using is relatively small. I think it's only about 100,000 reads. Um, we recently, in our uh, chicken study, uh, I think there's in the region of about 3 to 5 billion reads in that. And so cluster uh, compute clusters are really key to this, and I think it's taken us about five months to go through about 80 metatranscriptomes. There's lots of organization piecing stuff together. I think ideally we could probably do it in about two months, but these are big, big data sets that require a lot of processing, a lot of computation, a lot of organization in order to process from start to finish. But it's cool data. So any questions on this so far? Okay, 
All right, so I mentioned there are other pipelines, uh, one called Sansa. Uh, this one doesn't do an assembly step. It relies on this MGRAST tool, which uh, has anybody used MGRAST? And, and what do you think of it? <laughs> What's that? It's tricky. What did you think of the quality of the data that you got out at the end? Okay, so there, there does seem to be a bit of a backlash against MGRAST, and it's been around for, um, I guess, quite a number of years, and people aren't very happy with the kind of the quality of the annotations that are coming out of that. So um, it's a nice plug and play kind of tool that you can just upload your data set and it gives you a result at the end. Whether that's a good thing or not is really up for debate because you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. Some of the quality of the annotations you get can be a bit dodgy as well. So you're much better off if, you, if you're really wanting to dig into specific mechanisms and pathways that you're interested in, doing those kind of annotation things yourself. And that, that would be the suggestion. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'll probably address that in a couple of slides time, but uh, not really. Uh, just the sheer level of diversity kind of precludes that. All right, so first step in the process, filtering the reads. Um, so Trimomatic, has anybody used Trimomatic? Yeah, good. well, good. Some people have actually heard of it. Excellent, fantastic. So Trimomatic, fairly standard tool. Uh, does a very good job, uh, uses this sliding window approach to remove low quality sequence data. Uh, there's lots of different methods for doing that. Again, these pipelines, you can think of them as works in process. You have your kind of your uh, Python script that's running through each of these steps and then you can add in the tool as they get improved over time. Um, for filtering the ribosomal RNA, this is, this is our, our current curse. Um, so we rely on this tool called Infernal. Now, a lot of people have, you see, they publish their methods as using this sort me RNA. And sort me RNA is really good because it's fast, but it's really not that good because it misses about 50% of the ribosomal RNAs. And so that's why we go back to Infernal, because Infernal is a much more sensitive method for actually detecting ribosomal RNAs within your particular sequence. The downside is that it's particularly slow, and it's probably the slowest part of our pipeline. But we also have to start thinking about, as the kits get better at removing the ribosomal RNA, maybe this Infernal step is one that we don't even need to think about worrying about too much in the future. Okay, so I mentioned that we need to do read assembly. This graph here is just to show you that as you get into this kind of um, range, 180, 200 base pairs, your ability to annotate sequences really gets very good. So doing the assembly step we think is important because it gets you into um, this kind of size range where with the contigs you can actually identify what the source of that contig actually came from. Number of methods for doing assembly. Uh, previously, we've used Trinity. We've now started using spades, which seems to be um, doing a pretty reasonable job of assemblies. One of the problems that can occur within assemblies are chimeras, but in practice, we find that these chimeric sequences really, again, seem to be quite minimal relative um, to um, most of the assembled reads. So we don't normally worry too much about these chimeras. Uh, I should mention that, um, just as an anecdote, when we were using Trinity on one of our first data sets, um, we came out with one of the top hits in one of our samples, and we were looking at it, and we thought, wow, this is great. This is huge assembly. It's about 45 uh, kilobases that Trinity was able to assemble just from these messenger RNA reads. And we start looking at it, and we think, oh, this is interesting. It's, it's a phage genome. And it's from this deep scene, we're thinking, oh, maybe there's a lot of 
transfer between these different organisms uh, within this deep sea environment and this phage is uh, doing that. Look a bit further, it turns out to be Phyx, and Phyx is the spike in that you use during the sequencing. So that was a little disappointing. But on the other hand, it shows what a really good job these assembly tools can actually do when you're combining all of these reads from a messed up kind of genome from phage, and the assembly tools can actually recover that irrespective of all these other reads that are in there. So uh, it's, th these assembly programs really do a phenomenal job. Okay, so ideally what we've done is we've got a good set of messenger RNA reads. We've done our assembly, so we have a set of reads, a set of contigs. Okay, so our assembled reads, our unassembled reads. We've mapped them to these full-length transcripts. What we need to do now is we need to do functional annotations of these transcripts. So we need to first map these reads onto the, onto the transcripts. So how do we go about doing that? So we can use methods like BWA and BLAT. So we can download all of the genomes that we have available from the NCBI, and there's about 7,800 of them at the moment. There's a whole bunch of scaffolds and unassembled and not completely assembled stuff that adds up to about 20,000 genomes or so. And you can try these tools, BWA and BLAT, and try and match your sequences to each of these genomes. But these tools re re really rely on uh, almost perfect matches. And the problem is, is that there's a lot of diversity out there. So this is a study from, I think, 2007 or so, Streptococcus agalacti. And what they did is they did this rarefaction analysis to see every time you sequence a new genome of uh, Streptococcus agalacti, how many new genes do you get? And so the idea is that when you sequence a new strain, there's always going to be a whole bunch of new genes that you haven't seen before. So that's going to lead to genes that you're not going to be able to map to because you've just got one reference strain or maybe 10 reference strains. You don't have all the reference strains that are out there. The other problem we find is that the diversity at the nucleotide level, because of this third base pair wobble, you can have um, the same uh, protein sequence being generated by different strains. But then because the nucleotides are varying at that third base pair, I mean, because it just encodes the same um, uh, protein, that's going to vary from strain to strain as well. And so that strain diversity um, associated with both the nucleotide diversity associated with these new genes that you're just not capturing, this is why you're simply not able to use these uh, kind of microarrays specifically for bacteria because they're not able to capture that huge amount of diversity that we're going to see from sample to sample. Uh, so instead, we can use a tool like BLAST. So this is a typical match for a 71 base pair read. And you can see a problem here. The E value is not E to the minus 39, it's 39. And for those of you who've used BLAST, that's the kind of pick that you throw away. However, when you look at the actual match, it doesn't look too bad. When you look at the species it's coming from, it seems like, sure, that's probably where it's coming from. So rather than looking at e values, and this e value is um, a little bit ridiculous because it's a relatively short read, um, we can start thinking about uh, using things like percentage ID or percent of read length as indicators or cutoffs to say what we think is a good read, it is a, a good match. So in a way, it's a less sensitive version or, or a um, less precise version of BWA, but you're still trying to match as precisely as possible to known transcripts. Okay, so um, what we end up doing is um, we use this tool called Diamond, and Diamond's been a real savior because uh, Blast is, again, quite slow. It's one of the steps that really slows us down in processing these data sets. Diamond speeds things up by about a hundred to a thousand fold. So this has really uh, made processing a lot easier. And uh, we search against uh, protein databases, um, and this enables us to come up with pretty good uh, ability to annotate. So these are eight different mouse samples. Large chunk. This is a breakdown of, of what we find in these samples. So a large chunk here is adapter or low quality. So for some reason, during the library preparation uh, and the sequencing, the large chunk of low quality sequences, adapter sequences, so it's good that we remove those. The ribosomal RNAs, this blue bar here, 
And that's actually pretty low. So these, again, just to emphasize, these kits are doing quite a good job of really reducing the amount of ribosomal RNA that we're finding in our samples. And then these green bars here, these are our putative mRNAs. This dark green bar are our annotated reads. So we're actually doing a pretty good job now of being able to match our reads to our known, known genes. And then this small section here, it's about 10, 15%. These are the reads that we simply couldn't annotate to anything for one reason or another. Yeah? You mentioned that the samples are from the mice. So in that case, there will be a supply distribution in issues we get in. So these, sorry, the, this is a microbiome from mouse. Okay. It's not, so the host, there's a, there was really a minor amount of host that was in there, so which is being removed. That's why you're able to be rather than start or try to wait till a microbial uh, so what we do is we, we take the set of mouse transcripts and we use that in a filtering step and we do BWA against that set of mouse transcripts as a way of identifying and removing those host sequences. What's the red one? The red one? Uh, yes, interesting. It's, it's, it's not listed here, is it? That's, that's a secret DNA. No, I have no idea. It's, uh, <laughs> it's potentially host and it's been miscolored. Okay, so again, as we're getting more of these uh, genomes again in sequence, we're getting a better and better ability to actually doing some kind of annotation. Now, one thing I should say is going back to this kind of blast. Now, the reason we kind of feel we can get away with this is because we don't actually care about the specific species at this point. We're more worried about the function. And so it doesn't matter if it's matching to one bacteria or another bacteria at this point. We just want to get at what is the function associated with these transcripts. So in order to get at the taxonomy and identifying which kind of taxon are responsible, we have a whole different set of methods for annotating um, um, taxonomic information to each of these reads. So we now have these transcripts that we've identified that these reads map to, and we need to do a normalization step for expression. So we're turning the expression levels into these reads per kilobase of transcript mapped RPKM. So RPKM is a normalized uh, level of expression. And the main idea behind it is that you could have genes of different lengths, and you can have reads mapping to uh, these different lengths of genes. And you might expect that this gene is equally expressed relative to this gene. But because they're different lengths, you're going to be sampling much more from this one than you are from this particular gene if they're present in the population. So what the RPKM does, it normalizes on the kind of gene length. And so you end up with an RPKM value, which shows you that this gene is actually much more highly expressed than that gene. OK, so that's, that's really the main idea as to why we want to do this, this kind of normalization. Uh, so that's great. We've identified a set of full-length transcripts. We have a whole list of transcripts. We now have the RPKMs, the relative expression of each of these transcripts. What we want to do now is to actually identify functions associated with these transcripts. And so this is where you can plug in whatever kind of functional annotation tool you want. So you could do something very straightforward, and this is something that depresses me a little bit. You could just map it into gene ontologies, so these like biological processes, and you end up with these meaningless pie charts that show you whether there's nucleotide binding or amino acid biosynthesis or something like that. Not very informative, right? But a lot of people like doing them, so sure, go nuts. But um, you can be a bit more specific and start focusing on some systems that are more relevant to yourself. So we, we've had a long-standing interest in enzymes. We like enzymes metabolism because it's one of the best characterized systems that's out there. So it's been studied for over 100, 150 years or so. We know an awful lot about metabolism. It becomes quite easy and, and you feel quite confident about the results you get when you're mapping and identifying enzymes from your transcripts. So there's methods for identifying enzymes from your set of transcripts. Uh, recently, we've been interested, especially in our chicken study, looking at antimicrobial resistance. So we're using the card database, and we're going to plug the card database in as another annotation pipeline to see which transcripts can be annotated to which type of different antimicrobial resistance mechanisms. Uh, another area that we sit in is biofilms. So we have a set of genes, a set of gene families that we know are associated with biofilms. Again, we can use that set to pass our transcripts again <coughs> to identify uh, biofilm machinery within our particular data sets. So again, you can plug in whatever 
kind of subsystem, bacterial subsystem you want and increase the accuracy of your annotations and your functional annotations that way. So the one I want to focus in on is enzymes and that's because we do a lot of it and because uh, we think that some of the tools out there aren't doing it quite perhaps as, as well as they should. So uh, when you look at, at a lot of these pipelines, so Human 2 is a little guilty of this as well, they rely on BLAST, a large extent to BLAST. So they're blasting a transcript or a gene against a set of Swiss port enzymes. And from our own analyses, we know that that results in about a 50% false positive rate. So BLAST is a really bad tool for annotating enzymes. And the problem is, is the amount of diversity of different enzymes um, across, um, across different enzyme classes. So at one extreme, you have something like phosphoglycerate kinase, and these are the alignment scores where we've taken all the different examples of phosphoglycerate kinase and we've blasted them against each other, and we see how well do they discriminate from everything else, and these are hits to non-kinase. And you can see that the alignment score is very good. So you know if you hit one of these genes, it really is likely to be this phosphoglycerate kinase, and that's what these kinds of par charts these are positive hits, these are negative hits, there's no overlap. If you hit one of these enzymes, you know that's pretty good, you're going to hit it. At the other extreme, you have serine threonine kinases. You see there's a huge overlap between the positive and the negative hits. So if you hit one of these enzymes, you really don't know if it really is that enzyme or something else that isn't that enzyme. And then you have a whole set of stuff in between where, depending on the hit, you have a certain probability associated as to whether that really is that enzyme or not. So this is um, suggesting that we need better methods, more sensitive, cleverer methods to actually make use of this and recognize that different enzyme classes are easier to detect than others. So just as a plug, this is uh, our own piece of software called Detect. Uh, this is a precision recall kind of graph. Uh, this one here is NZP. That's quite widely used. I haven't even put blast here. Blast is kind of... Ugh. Down here somewhere. Uh, this blue one, preamp, that's that's pretty pretty useful, not bad. And then these are the detects, two versions of detect we came out with a new one recently, and then up here in X. We're starting to use these specific enzyme class specific cutoffs for predicting where an enzyme should be associated with that particular read or not. So we think that our tool's doing pretty good. The problem is it doesn't cover all enzyme classes because we in order to create these plots, you need a certain number of enzymes to create a reasonable kind of distribution. And we don't have it for all enzyme classes. So in practice, what we do, this is the overlap of enzymes that are detectable by these different methods. Uh, there's detect up there. You see it misses 1,200 enzymes that some of the other methods do. And so in practice, we use detect predictions, and then we use an intersection of preamp and blast. So we don't trust either by themselves, but we do trust their intersection, the combination of their predictions. If they both predict the same thing, then we can be reasonably confident that they are predicting um, the correct enzyme. Okay, so that's, again, just my little pet peeve that uh, when you're looking at enzyme annotations, just be aware that some of the methods that have been adopted, particularly if they're BLAST, you can get a lot of false positives out. Uh, so, as I mentioned, using something like BLAST enables you to get to the transcript, but we're not using it for taxonomic information. We think that there are more sensitive ways for inferring taxonomy of a sequence read than by BLAST, and there's a number of methods that have come out from that. So this is why we want to do that. So I, I guess I kind of undersold the idea because we find that different taxa can give the same functions. But we might actually be interested in knowing what is the specific taxon that is associated with an expressed gene? So there might be an interesting pathway that's been expressed. Is there one specific ta taxon that's responsible for providing that? So that's why we think going back and actually annotating the reads of the taxa is going to be important. So how do we go about assigning taxonomic information? Um, so there's a number of tools out there. A lot of them rely on either alignment methods. So BWA is quite good at mapping precisely to a genome, but they can fail when you don't have a complete set of reference genomes. Uh, other methods are based on comp uh, compositional methods, such as nucleotide frequency, codon biases. Uh, 
Um, so here we can split a sequence into um, uh, sets of threemas, and then you get a distribution of the frequency of each of these threemas within your particular sequence. And then you can map that frequency, pro frequency profile to frequency profiles associated with a whole bunch of different genomes. And that's what a lot of these kind of KMA-based approaches do. They build these profiles, and then they try and find a genome that has a similar profile. Okay, similar kind of uh, threema profile. With the idea being that there's going to be things like similar codons that have been used between that read and between the genome that you're actually using. Uh, so a number of methods. One of the best ones is actually this one called MVC, which seems to do a really good job um, at doing annotation, but it uses really long claimers. It doesn't use just threemas. I think it uses some like. 60 mers or something like that. But it does a where it gets where it gets things right, it gets them really right, so it's very good. Clark and Kraken, maybe not quite so good. Um, there's been a I'll just mention a couple of others. There's one called Kaiju. Um, uh, what to say about Kaiju? So Kaiju is fast. And and so a lot of people like it because it's fast. It does have large memory requirements, so you do, if you've got a large data set that you're comparing against, you do need a dedicated kind of server machine, some friend down the hall who's got a big kind of server thing. Um, but it's fast, so there is that. Uh, and then there's Centrifuge, that's uh, one that came out I think 2016 or 17 again. Again, it's fast, uh, so that's great. Um, it's, uh, it has lower memory requirements because it has this, I'm not going to go through this picture, but it has this kind of quite clever way of being able to compress genomes. So if you find similar genomes, similar sections of genomes in another genome, then you don't have to search against it. So it does a very good way of pruning your reference data set to bring it down to a more manageable level. One thing it does that is quite nice is that Rather than saying that it's going to take the top hit, it says, well, these four taxa are here are probably equally likely. So I'm just going to assign this read to all four of these taxa. And while that's possibly not intuitive, at least they're being honest about what their results actually mean and that they're saying, well, we don't really know if it's bacteroides or if it's a clostridia or if it's something else. Okay, and again, it's fast, which is great. How well do these actually perform? Uh, this analysis that Mobilagi did last year uh, compared diamonds, the results of diamonds, kaiju centrifuge from um, for this mouse gut microbiome. Diamond and kaiju, pretty similar. Uh, that's probably not too surprising because both diamond and kaiju are working in peptide space. So they're searching at the level of amino acids. They're not searching, they're not using nucleotide diversity to make their match. Centrifuge, on the, other hand, on the other hand, gives you quite a different distribution. So it's kind of like, oh, so which one really is correct? Is it going to be kaiju? Is it going to be centrifuge? Why is centrifuge giving you a different distribution? You look at the number of reads that have been annotated. Diamond is annotated about 80% of the reads. Kaiju, just over 50%. Centrifuge, only 25%. Okay, so maybe this difference is because centrifuge is just not able to annotate a lot of stuff that kaiju and diamond can. So what did notice when, when using kaiju or diamond in the protein space? It had trouble differentiating some very closely related bacteria. So, so, so sometimes, uh, say E. coli in, in close relatives of E. coli, sometimes you may see some in R, which is not that close to E. coli, still get called out by kaiju or diamond. So just a note of caution when you use, when you search in Protein space. Yeah, there are some very similar proteins across families are quite different. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. And so we, we've done a, I, I guess, a, because we didn't actually know what the breakdown should be for these reads in terms of taxon, we actually got hold of a gold standard. So uh, some time ago we sequenced uh, a mouse gut and it's an ASF. Um, like, who's heard of ASF? Oh, good. So, altered Schedler flora. Uh, so, it's a kind of a standard microbiome consisting of about eight or ten taxa that people use to inoculate uh, mice, germ-free mice, 
to actually have a defined microbiome that they know what's there. I think uh, two years ago, they finally sequenced all of those 10 organisms. And so we generated a metatranscriptome for that. We know we can then map to those known genomes because this was done in the germ-free mouse. There's nothing else in there. We can actually recapitulate a gold standard. And so what we did is we compared a whole bunch of different methods as to how well they're predicting at different levels. So as Will said, because you can get um, a, when you work in a peptide space, you can get a lot of hits against different E. coli. Maybe you can't annotate at these specific species levels. So these different colors represent how well you're doing at different levels. So this blue here represents being able to annotate accurately at the level of bacterial order. So you see, Clark and Kraken are only able to annotate around about 5% of the reads from this sample, which is a little bit suboptimal. NBC is doing pretty well, yeah. Up here, this dark gray bar is saying, these are bacterial reads. Great. Here we have kaiju, two, two versions of kaiju and centrifuge. Yeah, they're able to annotate around about 20%, 25% of the reads, which means you're throwing away 75% of your reads. But they're fast, so that's maybe why a lot of people are adopting them. This is our own in-house tool, there's a bit of a plug called GIST. Um, it's able to do pretty good at the order level, uh, but not, not so well beyond. So it's not kind of suggesting, it's not saying, oh, I'm super great, I can only uh, I, I can annotate things at level strain. It's kind of very honest and saying, well, we can only suggest that it's uh, able to identi think, identify things at the order level. The problem is it's slow, and people don't like slow. So this is, again, a pet peeve. Current trend seems to be for tools that are fast, irrespective of performance. So this seems to be propagated by journal editors as well who seem to like publishing stuff that is fast because they think people are going to adopt it but I really would caution you against using these kind of fast methods unless you start looking at how well are they actually performing for your specific data set. So when they publish their tools, they run it against their pet data set and they may have trained it well for their data set and it might perform very well for their own data set. But if you look how they perform in your own data set, it might be doing a really poor job. So just a word of caution. Uh, the other thing to mention here is you could compare your messenger RNA levels to your ribosomal RNA levels. So you could, the 16S that are filtering through that you chuck away, you could use those as an indicator of what your taxonomic abundance should be looking like. You could perform a 16S profile at the same time as you're doing the metatranscriptomics run as well. And you could use that kind of information to help bootstrap and identify what taxa should be present, should be expressed in your samples. But just a word of caution again, uh, 16S isn't necessarily the same as uh, better transcriptomics. So these are paired samples. This is messenger, this is messenger RNA, this is ribosomal RNA. The kind of profiles you get out aren't going to be exact. There's going to be some taxa that might be in high abundance that aren't very active. Conversely, there might be some taxa that are in very low abundance that are very active and are responsible for generating a lot of gene expression. Uh, in terms of visualization, um, this is a tool you're going to be using in the tutorial, I think. Uh, it's called Krona. Um, it's quite pretty. I'm not sure that you'd ever use it in your actual paper, but it's kind of fun because you can look at these things and it zooms out and zooms in. It gives you kind of a feeling for what kind of um, what, what kind of taxa um, and relative abundance of those taxa uh, in an interactive way uh, in a kind of web browser. So it's kind of a cool tool. Okay, so you've gone through a couple of months, hopefully, of processing your data sets and annotating these data sets and turning them into functions and taxonomy. How do we go about exploring the end result? How do we actually visualize the data to make some sense of it? And so because these are very complex data sets, you're looking at transcripts, hundreds of thousands of transcripts. We need some way of organizing them into something that makes sense to us. And so this is where we think systems biology can come in. So rather than focusing on broad functional categories, such as the gene ontology categories or the COG categories, these graphs where you see that 20% of your reads are associated with nucleotide processing or whatever, which kind of leave you a, a little bit lost, you can start thinking about using some of these kind of systems used. So 
We think of things in terms of functional modules, so groups of genes that are working together to provide a consistent function. And we think if you can identify sets of genes within these modules in the same module that are consistently being up or down regulated, then that is a pretty good indication that that functional module as a whole is actually important or not important in your particular microbiome. And there's an increasing number of these kind of functional modules appearing now for bacteria. You can think of uh, protein complexes, organizing your genes into protein complexes, metabolic pathways we've heard a lot about, uh, signaling pathways as well. So there's these kind, this kind of idea that start thinking about organizing your data in terms of something that makes sense to you in, in, in these kind of bacterial subsystems. Uh, so there's uh, several tools that enable you to place your data uh, or will give you these outputs as part of their automated pipelines. So MGRAST again will give you this kind of nice um, seductive view if you like of a pathway that makes you think, wow, this is great, we've got all of this particular pathway here. Without kind of digging in and understanding that most of these enzymes might have been erroneously annotated. Uh, I mean, it looks cool, and so you can have these kinds of network maps that kind of show you which enzymes are actually present in your sample. Uh, Megan's gone a little bit um, higher, and rather than having a single color, you now have a gradient of color where you can actually show the relative expression of each of these enzymes within the context of the pathway. One of the problems I have with these kinds of maps is that these are based on keg maps. Keg maps are defined on the basis of three organisms, I believe, E. coli, yeast, human. We're sequencing organisms that are not E. coli, yeast, or human, and so these reference maps may not actually be that relevant. In addition, there might be connections between pathways that you're missing. So this substrate here might be found here, and so there might be an enzyme maybe into converting between them. And so there might be a chunk of enzymes which are moving along that kind of direction, which may be upregulated, but you won't see that because all of these pathways are kind of just visualized in isolation. You're not getting the global picture. You're not seeing the interconnections. Okay, so these kind of borders, artificial borders that these kind of pathway views can be a little bit misleading. So that's why we're kind of trying to advocate these kind of more network views. Um, so we, in our lab, we do a lot of these kind of metabolic reconstructions where you take a genome of an organism, you identify all the enzymes, and then you kind of reconstruct all of the pathways associated with that. So each of these nodes here represents an enzyme, and then we try and organize them into these particular uh, kind of systems. So the problem with this is that uh, these are very complex. It takes a lot of time to click and drag all of these nodes one by one. Uh, and so there's real need for more standardized methods for kind of giving you these kind of global metabolic network views, if you like, that can enable you to look at some of the interactions across different pathways. Um, and in actual fact, KEG, um, to be fair, have actually come out with quite a nice plugin um, where you can, well, so it's, a, so it's a tool called Cytoscape. Who's heard of Cytoscape? Wow, that's polarizing. Yes, no, wow. Uh, so Cytoscape is a really good visualization tool for um, placing uh, genes, for example, in some kind of functional context. So each gene might represent a node, and then they're connected to other genes, other nodes, if there's some kind of functional relationship between them. So that's basically what this view is here. This is a cytoscape view to each of these enzymes is being linked to other enzymes through substrates. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a graph view, if you like, where you can start placing things together based on their functional relationships. So Cytoscape actually features a plugin from KEG where you can download the KEG views and then you can add in your own data, superimpose your own data to create these kind of quite nice views where rather than nodes just being colored according to whether they're present or absent, you can now start thinking about taking the taxonomic information that you so carefully put together, together with your enzyme information, to create these kinds of pie charts. So these pie charts can show you by their size, the relative expression of that enzyme, but also the taxonomic contributions associated with that enzyme as well. So you can start seeing 
which tax were contributing to specific functions. So these tools are pretty cool to use and um, it's the sort of thing that you just want to sit down on a Friday afternoon and upload one of these things and just play around and then think, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. And it's a very intuitive tool and again, as part of this tutorial, hopefully you'll get a chance to use um, part of Cytoscape and, and generate these kinds of views. Um, beyond metabolism, we can also do protein-protein interaction networks or protein complexes. So this is this uh, cell wall biogenesis kind of module. So each of these represents an individual gene and then they're functionally linked according to whether they're part of the same pathway or they have a physical interaction. And so again, you can use these as a kind of a scaffold to layer on your kind of um, metatranscriptomic data, so the genes that they've been annotated to, so the transcripts associated with cell wall biogenesis, and then these pie charts again indicate the taxonomic contributions associated with each of those different functions, and so you might find that these three genes here are pretty consistently expressed by bacteroides. Okay, so it starts giving you an idea of consistency of expression within certain taxonomic groups. Okay, so uh, just a uh, couple more slides, sorry I've run over a little bit of time. Uh, so statistical uh, considerations, so metatranscriptomics, again it's a relatively limited field at the moment, there haven't been that many tools, that, dedicated tools that have been um, developed for analysis of metatranscriptomics. So in terms of statistics, how many biological replicates, we're saying at least two, probably at least three, um, but we have to bear in mind that these are expensive experiments. Uh, power analyses. So there have been some papers out recently which are describing how to do a power analysis for 16S and I think even metagenomic data sets. I haven't seen anything so far for metatranscriptomic data sets. So that's all a little bit hand wavy at the moment. In terms of methods for identifying uh, differentially expressed significance in the differentially expressed genes, uh, there's a tool called ALDEX2 which is um, uh, very powerful, but uh, it isn't very sensitive. So um, when you run Aldex2, you don't actually get that many hits back because it's, it's, it seems to be very restrictive. DEC2, on the other hand, uh, which was developed for uh, RNA seq data sets, specifically for RNA seq data sets, actually seems to perform pretty well for uh, metatranscriptomics. Um, and there's, uh, I think, Rob. Uh, this afternoon is going to be talking about the benefits of things like ALDEX2 um, and the seq being able to treat data as compositional data. So we have to remember this is compositional data as opposed to giving you an absolute abundance. And Rob will talk a lot more about that uh, this afternoon. Uh, and again, I think most of the power of these analyses is if we can convert our transcripts into gene sets into these functional modules, that gives us a much more um, reassuring view of consistency of changes in expression and we can use genes and enrichment analyses as a way of giving a, a significance kind of um, level of approval to whether these functional modules, pathways, protein complexes and so forth really are differentially expressed from one sample to another. So ultimately uh, we're thinking metatranscriptomics uh, can be viewed as hypothesis generating. So if you identify a transcript or a module that seems to be upregulated in one mouse compared to another mouse, maybe you want to go in design a new experiment and see in more sensitive experiment whether that module really is up or down regulated and you can get your statistical power that way. But um, for the most part we're viewing metatranscriptomics as, as really hypothesis generating. Um, just as for 16S and metagenomic data, we can produce these kinds of principal component plots. Uh, this was just a fun set of plots from our original mouse study, the PLIN2 study. We find that there is no real significance in taxa, uh, except at the level of diet. But for it, when we're looking at significantly differentially expressed transcripts, when we're looking at enzymes across samples, when we're looking at pathways, then we're starting to see significant separation between Sample. So again, just to emphasize that you can have the same community, but the actual functions that they're expressing can change dramatically. Uh, just to mention again, DEC, EDGAR, ALDEX2, again, these are pretty good for doing differential expression. And then we can use things like hypergeometric assess, gene set enrichment analyses, 
to identify groups of genes that have um, that, that have some kind of significance associated with their expression when you combine them all together. Uh, and with that, uh, I think it must be way beyond time for a break, and we will be moving on to the tutorial. And the tutorial is one that uh, we've been tweaking for the last two or three years. It's a data set of 100,000 reads from one of our uh, mouse metatranscriptomes, and it will take you through the various steps of processing, going right from the raw sequence data all the way down to these kind of cytoscape views. Hopefully you can complete that in two hours. Hopefully you think, Cytoscape's fantastic. I should be using this. Even if I'm not going to do metatranscriptomics, I should still be using Cytoscape as a way for visualizing a lot of my data anyway. Uh, yeah. So, uh,